Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 45. This episode is Dr. Lonnie Brooks. Dr. Brooks is a professor of communications at Cal State University at East Bay. And he's also a great dude. Yeah, this was really, really fun. I must say, going into this, I was very nervous because I know for a fact he is way smarter than me. And um, you know what? It wasn't a problem because he is such a down-to-earth guy and uh, really articulate. And the stuff that we talk about is really, really interesting. Uh, and I think you're really going to dig. And um, we find out a lot of really cool things. Like, he's from Oakland, and by the time he was 18 years old, he'd already been diagnosed with diabetes and had open heart surgery, where they put a metal thing in there, which I didn't even know was possible. Uh, so we talk about that. We talk about technology, where we think it's going. We talk about um, art and tech, the future of tech, how rapidly it's gone. We, we touch a little bit on AI. Um, and then we get into... Uh, Afrofuturism, which is a really cool and interesting movement um, that I highly recommend you check out. He's the co-host of a podcast called the Afrofuturist Podcast. Um, it's so, it's so interesting and uh, so different, and I think it's a conversation that uh, is worth having. I think it's super cool. And uh, we talk about Black Panther. Black Panther's so good. If you haven't seen it, you need to check it out. Um, and how Black Panther is actually a really good example of Afrofuturism. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, without further ado, uh, enjoy this episode with uh, my new friend, Dr. Lonnie Brooks, and uh, theme song time. too man how's your day going oh pretty good just uh taking care of you know uh some chores the laundry <laughs> sure <laughs> typical sunday yeah that makes sense this whole uh, this whole skype recording thing is so weird like i'm not i'm not good with i guess interfaces specifically ones that like are different than what i learned on <laughs> it's one of those like you know <laughs> we're creatures of habit so you're used yeah. to the way certain buttons work, and you're like, oh, normally I just press this and we're fine. And uh, yeah. not the case. <laughs> not the case. But uh, it's been it's been good. I, I learned that because uh, I did one uh, talk with, with Skype on, and it was totally fine, or so I thought. And then I found uh -huh. out it only records calls, not video feed. And I learned, uh -huh. I learned it a little, little too late. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay with the magic of editing no one knew oh that's nice yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean they're gonna know now because i'm saying it but <laughs> but it's good it's good uh so you are in you're in california right yeah i'm in uh, north oakland in california and and you're in florida i am in florida i'm in uh southwest florida naples specifically oh Great. Yeah, it's a place that's really strange because it's it's like a lot of people don't know where it is, but then the people that do, it's like how what? It's it's directly across from Miami, like the opposite coast. Ah, right. A literal wow. literal straight shot. You just get on wow. seventy five, go right over, and you will hit Naples. It's wow. A, yeah, it's a very strange. But Oakland, right on, right on. <laughs> is, are you from Oakland? You know, I'm from Los Angeles originally. I was I was born and raised there. Really? Uh, yeah, and I grew up um, in the Baldwin Hills area. Okay. And then left there when I was nine. That that used to be called like that was kind of known as the the black neighborhood. Sure. And then and then I grew up in uh, moved to the Fairfax district, which is more had a more Jewish character. Sure. So <laughs> and right. uh, yeah. That must have been really interesting. Yeah, it's definitely um, such a diverse place. You know, um, I I went to the Jewish Community Center too, cool. and uh, became part of a drama group. And um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's it it nothing like growing up near Sunset Boulevard. 
you yeah, know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's more flavor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's cool yeah I, I, when i was in los angeles i did not know ahead of time that there's like the city of los angeles and then there's the county of los angeles which has like a hundred subsets it's cr- yeah. it's so crazy and different <laughs> that was when i learned I was like you're still technically in la county i was like i'm i'm not even close to los angeles it's like no you kind of are it's a it's a it's a valley weird little thing yeah but, but very yeah. very different. Uh, I like the I like the vibe of Los Angeles a lot. It seems that everyone there is like trying to make a thing. Right. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. But uh, so interesting. Okay, so you went from one to another. What was that like growing up? Um, really interesting because I was um. So my my dad was a a, a struggling black artist and writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and he created he created a foundation for struggling black artists, sure. and um, he also produced a play about the black experience in Vietnam. Really? Yeah, yeah. So he was he. I don't know how he did it, but he did tremendous outreach. He was kind of an aspiring investigative reporter too. Cool. I think he interviewed Amos and Andy at what? one point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was on the scene of the. Patty Hearst bank robbery shootout thing. Wow. He was on a morning show with Rosie Greer at one point. Dude. I mean, like, like a, you know, just a, a interview. And so I'm, you know, so I'm amazed at how much he achieved given his constraints. Cause he didn't have much college and, sure. um, but he came from Kansas city, Missouri. So he came out here to make his thing in LA, you know? Sure. And, um, and then growing up in the Fairfax district was really interesting because I kind of grew up in a performative environment. So we were doing Shakespearean plays and Broadway plays and going to the New Art Theater in Santa Monica to see Shakespearean movies. And, you know, so there's a lot of performance. Right. And then I, when I got to UCLA, I got involved in black theater and did some performances that way, too. I had to very fantastic um, professor named Beverly Robinson who taught the history of black theater. Mm-hmm. And so she got, when she was doing her lectures, they were pretty much performances of the characters we were talking about. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know there's that much performance background. So that's really cool. And your dad he seems like just a super creative person that like investigative journalism is a, a mind thing. You know, it's a lot of figuring stuff out and it has to be an interest in the truth. And then he wrote a play. That's that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. He produced a play about the black experience in Vietnam, yeah. and then he also created a, his own screenplay about his journey called "No Room for an Overcoat." Oh, that's which, an awesome um, title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or no place for an overcoat. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. So you know, uh, so he talks about his experiences coming from Kansas city to California and what that was like. Sure. And, uh, yeah. So, um, and, and my mom was always reading a book. So it's kind of like, we were always talking about what she was reading. Sure. And it's cool. Was it your dad uh, that inspired you wanting to get into theater because he was also into it or was it around the same time or how did that come to be? Um, well, it was a, a combination of things. I think, um, Knowing that he was a writer w- w- fueled my imagination. Mm-hmm. And then um, being part of a, the drama group at the Jewish Community Center was really got me involved. Um, because once I, you know, I, you can't really understand Shakespeare. It's hard to under- understand Shakespeare unless you're acting it out. Oh, yes. Very true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the kinesthetic, you know, mind body connection mm-hmm. really helped to cement the meaning of of those words. And, um, and that's when I really got how performance enables you, your imagination to come to light. Sure. Sure. And, and you kind of have to, for your body to go, what your mind is saying, there has to be a, a an understanding. Whereas just reading Shakespeare, you're like, I, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then seeing, seeing Star Trek too, you know, yeah. my imagination even more. Cause I grew up with that and, you know, it's a total, high school geek with Star Trek posters all around my walls. There you go. (laughs) Did you have a favorite character? 
Well, you know, Lieutenant Uhura was one of my favorites. I mean, nice. You know, she's kind of like the the um, the pre Shuri. Yeah. Character, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> and still has great hair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's gold. That's cool, though. So you you were, I, I mean, I, I knew this, had to have. Yeah, you were into sci-fi stuff growing up as well. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really was. I mean, um, I, I also grew up with, um, I got diabetes when I was young, mm-hmm. and so technology was an important part of what I had to do to uh, control control my diabetes. Sure. Uh, type 1, you know, so mm-hmm. I had to watch out for my sugar and just be in tune with science and technology as a practical reality. So for me, it was like, okay, bring it on. Let's get more. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You're watching Star Trek be like, how do I get that to do this? Yeah. To kind of try right. to combine the two. So, you, so wow, around the time you were diagnosed with diabetes was around the same time you were also doing this theater and stuff as well? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dude, no. talk about overcoming adversity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I love that. Like not not that, but like the idea that I feel like the people who have it harder in life earlier on end up developing into like something way crazier, like in the best sense. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like it, it's one of those like as this old saying, it says like the strongest swords are forged by the hottest fires, type of thing. Yeah. And I think anyone who's on the precipice of any sort of evolution of anything had a really hard time up up at front. And, uh, wow, that's pretty interesting. Very, very yeah. cool. I mean, I think it, 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 it reaches back into, you know, African and Native American traditions. Of, of course. Of you know, the, the shamans, the, the, the seers, you know, had to overcome something oh, to, yeah. uh, to, uh, to see, to forecast the future. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. Oh, we're getting into that. So, uh, what were what were some other interests you had growing up? Like you, you were a geek. I can relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, I got the Star Trek manual mm-hmm. uh, that had all the all the blueprints for the ships. Oh, you sweet know. little cross section <laughs> stuff. Yeah, right, right. The cross sections. Yep, yep. You had. I mean, how else are you gonna know where the warp drive is? Let's be honest. Great. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I had a favorite hobby store in Baldwin Hills that I would go to and. Buy like ten versions of the same Star Trek ship, Good. and uh, it was always about trying to get those those engines to stand up with crazy glue. Oh yes, oh yes. You know, I I was the same with with action figures. Just oh, yeah? you're like, there's like zero points of articulation. Why aren't they standing? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> same, same thing. You're like, glue. We're we're figuring this out because you need to look cool on my shelf. Right, right. <laughs> what did what did, what did you want to be when you grew up, as a kid? Like, what were what were your big dreams? Yeah, well, you know, definitely astronaut or um, math mathematician, um, scientist in the spirit of Star Trek and Star Wars. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, I really thought at one point like I could work for NASA. Yeah. You know. Um, and, and build those, help build those ships or navigate them. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, in fact, I mean, I saw a Star Star Wars in 1977 at the Grandma's Chinese Theater. A what? Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Speaking, yeah. Of, speaking of history, <laughs> it's like the moment that changed the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I saw that seven times. Yeah. Smart. I mean, <laughs> you can't just see it one. Then I'd think you were crazy. <laughs> Anyone who just saw Star Wars once in 1977, uh, I, I don't know if I'd get along with that person. <laughs> like, you just don't get it. I mean, that changed cinema and and everything. But that's pretty neat. So NASA, did you have you? So there are two types of people. You know, there are there are the people that want to see space from the ground and people that want to be in space. Which one were you? I, I was definitely like I wanted to be in space. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I, I do. I mean, I wanted to. And, sure. Uh, you know, at this point, it's like okay. Well, maybe I'll wait till it gets to be like a Southwest experience. Yeah, good idea. But... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I wanted to be in the in the on the bridge and 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 navigator do communications. 
were, sure. you know, and that's what I loved about Star Trek, that it was about the culture. Like what I came to realize is like, I like the technology, but it's really how the technology interacted with the culture For that sure. was fascinating to me. For sure. Know? I always said that like the diff- the biggest difference between uh, Star Trek and Star Wars was Star Wars had like, you know, the Jedi and the, the more mysticism and the force Whereas uh, Star Trek was very science based, like it, it was our eventual future, you know, the USS Enterprise, and it was like the final frontier. It was very, in a weird way, kind of grounded in reality, but also not. Right. It's kind, it's kind of neat. It's kind of, and now like, yeah. you know, so you were alive for the uh, space station, <laughs> and right. like, landing on the moon and stuff. That's that's pretty cool. So at, at what point did uh did that shift from astronaut to uh the next thing? Well, you know, um I think it was so another thing I've been partially blind for most of my life until recently. Really? Um you yeah. Can't, you can't just gloss over this stuff, Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Man. I mean, I have a I was born with a genetic condition called Marfan syndrome. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh Abraham Lincoln had it. And it's really just a disease of the connective tissue. Uh-huh. So, um, so for your eyes, technically, like my lens was slightly detached from from the retina. Okay. Um, so it would float, and it made me very nearsighted. Cool. And um, and it makes you taller. So like Abraham Lincoln was tall. Yeah. You, you know. I mean, it, there has to be a good side to something. You can't. Yeah. You can't win them all. Right. You can't. <laughs> And, you know, for some athletes, too, um, that haven't known that they have a condition, some have died on the court because it's a condition that develops with your um, your heart valves that um, really they expand uh, and can burst. And so um, so along with that, I, I, I had uh, open heart surgery to replace a heart valve, too. What? Um, yeah. So <laughs> so I have I'm like a cyborg. I have da- da- Dacron tubing in my uh in a, in a metallic heart valve. What? So, can you feel it? Uh, you can, you know, when I first had that surgery, I, I, I heard the valve clicking and I was like, Oh my God, what? am I going to have, am I going to hear this for the rest of my life? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. I was really out at first. And then it, and then of course it, I got used to it. I didn't hear it anymore. Except that one time when I'm in the library at UCLA with, oh, um, no. <laughs> with some, that I had a crush on, and they said, "Is that your heart?" <laughs> <laughs> like, quick, quick! Think of a pickup line. Think of a pickup line. <laughs> yes, and it clicks for you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> that is crazy. I didn't even know you could put metal stuff in your heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah it can be done now. We have the technology. Wow. And um, so, and that was back in the '80s. So, um, you know. It's, uh, I mean, before that, they would do transplants with pig and cow valves, but, you know, yeah. those would out. So the metallic was the best way sure. to go, basically. So, um, so along with that, yeah. And now with my insulin pump, I, I am officially a cyborg. That's right. You are, you are bordering more machine than man, Dr. Brooks. Yes, yes. <laughs> man, that's crazy. I didn't know any of this stuff. I, so, I basically built a show on me learning new things. So oh, well. <laughs> it's like, it's like that old saying, you know, like uh, the more you see, the less you know. Yeah. That welcome to the interesting podcast. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that open heart surgery. Yeah, that Dude. was in when I was eighteen. When so, you were eighteen. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. And you're still kicking. Yep. Yep. There yep. you go, <laughs> man. I am all about that. Because I, I grew up in a really, really poor neighborhood as well, and and surrounded by people that had very, very little opportunity or very little frame of mind. You know, they were like, you know, it's just acceptance. You know, this is what it is, and it is what it is. And yeah. so it's very interesting to see people come from those sort of circumstances and rise above. And it takes a specific type of person to survive, in my opinion. And like, dude, you, 18? That blows my mind. Like <laughs> diabetes even before then, and then open heart surgery at eighteen. That is crazy. That's a, that's amazing. And then you went on to become Doctor Lonnie Brooks. Yeah. Well done. Right. Well done, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. So after open heart surgery, like, what did that change your perspective? It had to have, right? 
Or were you yeah. too, were you young enough? You're like, please, I click now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was. I was like, I have to see the world now. Yeah. I, 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 and and I promptly went on a on a year abroad in Spain through UCLA. What? And, um, yeah, I was like, okay, I you know, I I I've learned one way, you know, through school, mm-hmm. and I, I will continue to do that, you know, all my life. But I need to balance it with really being in in uh in a new environment sure. um, where i'm learning learning something learning the language sure. and and the culture so i you know and that was in 85 86 so mm. way back but it was an interesting time in spain when franco had just recently died and there's a cultural flowering yeah in spain and then of course i had to go to morocco because uh, you know africa is right next door yeah, so you have to. Yeah. How was that? Ah, amazing, amazing. And, you know, it's so funny because that's, like, partly where Star Wars was filmed, right? Yeah. Uh, And, uh, but really amazing because it was the first time I had seen people that looked like me on, in mass. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, people thought I spoke French and Arabic and, (laughs) you know. Of course. (laughs) And, um so I I would tell them that my father was from Nigeria because technically we are West part part West African. Cool. So so I got a discount. Hey, um, there you go. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, it, it was really amazing. I mean, to see Marrakesh as a city that's pretty much a red city, like like it's bathed in red clay. Yeah. And fantastic food and the calls to prayer from the minaret. I mean, it's just. Uh, it was a mystical experience, sure. um, you know, permeated with culture everywhere. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, that's so cool. I am so into culture because like just the idea that a people have something that is their own, I guess is the best way that I can explain it. Uh, cause I like traveling as well to have the worldview opened, but like, Oh, things are different here. This is how these people are. And I have yet to be, I've yet to go to Spain or Morocco. So that sounds amazing. Just everything's red, really. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, and um, I mean, it was it was neat to to see, you know, how people worked and lived there. Um, sure. Um, and, and the food's amazing. With couscous. Um, yeah. And you know, I just I was so enamored. I like I bought a jalaba. You know, oh, yeah? one of those. Uh, you know, like uh, what is Luke Skywalker's uh, mentor had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, I, I I could not take it with me. It was just too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I would have tri- I would have tried to. I'm like, how do we how do we figure this out? <laughs> yeah. If I break it down, how do I put it back together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. That's cool, though. So, where else have you been? Um, I've been to um. Japan. What? I've been to uh, everything you're saying. You say uh, so casually. <laughs> You've been to Japan. <laughs> what part of Japan? Um, to Tokyo and um, uh, Yokohama and um, another city a little west in Japan. Um, that's an amazing area. I mean, a, a nation in terms of like you know you grow up with. The anime, you know, oh, yeah. Speed Race, Kimba, and and those types of shows, and God, Godzilla, and then you know, you you can see the kind of devotion to 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 various subcultures there, and te- technology, and oh yeah, and design, like that's everything there. It was so 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 fantastic. I managed to find a a. a Picasso Museum in the hills of um, the big park there. I forgot what the park is called now. But anyway, it was breathtaking because it overlooked a, a canyon. And um, <clears throat> so I just really admire Japan. Sure. I, I'm obsessed yeah. with Japan. Even growing oh, yeah? up, even growing up, it's just such a cool, I like, I always like the samurai and just like the idea of the culture behind them. And, their way of lifestyle and just the discipline. And I I remember watching uh, this documentary, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Do you ever see that? 
Oh, no, I don't think I have. It's really good. I think it's still on Netflix. And there's this guy who owns this, like, little, like, 10-seat bar in Japan. You have to get on a waiting list for, like, a year and a half. And you get, I think, one piece of sushi. But he's, like, the master who's dedicated his entire life to this. And I guess at, like, three or four years old, his parents were, like, pick something and dedicate your life to being the best. And I was, like, at three? I was, like, still running into doors at three. Like, nope, we, they will be the best. And just the discipline in the culture is just so – it makes sense why they're – why yeah. they're, especially, like, technology, like you said. They're next level – Speaking, which we'll get to, uh, the future. Uh, <laughs> that's crazy, though. Japan, were you there for school as well or for just part of the traveling? I, uh, mostly to travel. Um, cool. Uh, my, my partner was there. Uh, she uh, was in Japan for two years. And, cool. Um, and then so that was really great to see. Um, and then being in Spain, of course, I was able to travel more. And then more, more recently, I've been – traveling to scandinavia more often really than i uh, realized I ever would mm-hmm. so yeah uh, just conferences that have been in norway and sweden and um sure. and in germany too in berlin um and uh, just have been fascinated with scandinavian culture because that's also another culture really d- devoted to design <laughs> yeah oh, absolutely and it, uh, my my dad's grandparents are from scandinavia Oh. A certain part, and they're like he's a Viking dude. So that's another thing. Like they invented boats. You're like, what is going on here? <laughs> people, people, man. the The human spirit is just crazy. It is way of life that people figure out. Like I said earlier, ways to survive. Man, that's nuts. Yeah. So even as a kid, yeah. were you were you always interested in the future because of Star Trek and stuff like that? Definitely. Definitely, I I, uh, I read a lot of sci- science fiction, especially when I was in the hospital for my diabetes briefly mm-hmm. to kind of on the regimen. Uh, one of my camp counselors came with a whole box of classic science fiction from Heinlein to Arthur C. Clarke to Asimov, and I just ate it up. Yeah, you know, and um, and so like Asimov's Foundation trilogy was really what I thought Star Wars would be. Right. You know? <laughs> uh because and and then the main one of the main characters in that story Harry Seldon is the one who foresees the future of the of the galaxy right right uh, through math and i just love that i was so enamored with that so um so for me um science fiction was always fascinating you know like i i love logan's run i i love space 1999 mm-hmm. i love um harlan ellison's the star lost yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, it's about um, yeah, you know that the the yeah. the, the ship of domes, yep. <laughs> and people forget they're in, a, in a dome, and they think it's just the world. Oh yes, and each dome has a different culture, and uh, and so some people in an Amish-like community wake up and realize that they're in a ship, and try to wake everyone else up before they fall into a star. Yeah, it's <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So for me, um, science fiction has been my my approach to the world. You know, um, sure. The kind of combination of of how technology becomes magic. Yeah, know? it's it's pretty funny how <laughs> how that it's usually hand in hand. It's like the the impossible inspires someone to make it possible. Like you know, you have yeah. to see you have to see it to believe it kind of thing. That's why representation matters so much. And it's like exactly. once once you have an idea of like oh this I've I've seen it now you know where like I remember uh, a bunch of years ago uh, my parents were watching the show which is super old and <laughs> it's called mm-hmm. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon and I mean it's like bl- it's black and white like old school TV right yeah and there's a part when this guy it, it's, it takes place in like the old west and whatever we're in the Yukon but it's old west times and. Uh, they're taking this picture, and you know it was one of those like big camera things with the hood over, and then you take the picture, and some guy just goes, "You know, one day they're gonna make a camera that'll fit in your pocket." And <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god, this guy! If only he knew." <laughs> and like, imagine—I have just imagined somebody watching that be like, "Wow, what if they did make a camera that'll fit in your pocket?" And uh, well, look at where we are now. 
So it's 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 the importance yeah. of like science fiction has done so much. When you talk to astronauts and people that are on the precipice of scientific breakthroughs now, they're like, "Oh yeah, I like Star Trek and Star Wars growing up." They're like, "Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, so this does matter." <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's crazy to oh. me. So, uh, uh, so at what point were you like, "I'm," because right now you're a professor at Cal State at East Bay. Am I correct? Right. Okay. So, at what point were you like, "I'm going to." teach was teaching always a thing that you wanted to do as well or did that like naturally fall into or how did that come to be you know it was um i always wanted to be a writer like my father Mm -hmm. um and i realized i i could help and tutor people um you know when i was at ucla and in graduate school Mm -hmm. and um and when i came i so when i went into graduate school and became part of uh, an intern at the Institute for the Future, um, I realized that I had met a group of people that were writing science fiction. Oh, you know, okay. And, um, and they were doing it, um, getting paid to do that, you know, for companies, right. nonprofit agencies and governments. And I thought, wow. And, I thought, well, <clears throat> you know, either I'm going to join this place <laughs> right. or I'm going to become a professor and do the same thing. And, in fact, my mission was to make the future more transparent to people of how of how forecasters were sure. um, matching our futures. And so, um, and so for me, um, being able to do research, teaching, and writing seemed like, well, that's a goldmine. Sure. That's what I want to do. And um, and so I really like the reflective space that universities allow us to be in. Um, and at the same time, being able to kind of see what research was going on, too, around me in, in industry. Right. And, and so when I became part of um, the Institute for the Future, um, and before that, I was an intern at Interval Research Corporation, which was um, founded by the co-founder of Microsoft, Paul Allen. What? Yeah, it was a, back in 92, he created it, and I came in in 95 as an intern with the um, Explorers group. We, we did, like, user research experience studies. Right, right. It's, and, uh, you know, I would study college culture at the time. and uh, But people, like, really interesting people were there, like Brenda Laurel, who did a, the first girls a game for girls called Purple Moon, and, um, hmm. you know, filmmakers, um and technologists were there, people from the Royal College of Art, and they were incubating new new digital industries, basically. Sure. And so that was so much fun. Um, they were very proprietary at the time, or I would have done my dissertation on them. Mm-hmm. But I ended up at the Institute for the Future and really realizing, um, because what they did was they taught people about the future. And sure. so I realized it would be the same thing for undergraduates and graduate students as well. Mm-hmm. And so when I got hired at Cal State East Bay in 2003, I basically was creating courses for for them that looked at their future. <laughs> what? Okay, that's cool. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, any class I had, I would try to spin it towards the future in some way. So it was under the radar. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Interpersonal relations, okay, you know, let's let's map out you know, your future, how you're going to relate to people in the future, you know? Sure. Uh, <laughs> As a scientific fortune teller. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. And, uh, and the great thing about the Institute for the Future is that they are a nonprofit, so they had to make their research available. Right. So I could use some of their material in my classes, too. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, and that was fun to adapt and see. Um, and then... In 2012, we had we had an angel investor who really was interested in the Long Now Foundation mm-hmm. and wanted to also bring futures research to K through 12, and we convinced him to to bring it to a college um, audience or uh, students, and he helped us to create the Long Term and Futures Thinking Project at our campus. Oh wow! 
And yeah, and um, and through the and then we were partnered with the Long Now. They made their um, podcasts available to us before they went public with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we would have my students look at the professional life forecasts in let's say twenty forty or twenty fifty four. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 think about that. You know, what does twenty forty look like? And and how do organizations change? And um, how do we? And and also, how do we hear the voices of of, of minorities and working Absol- class folks? Absolutely, you know? that's crazy. Because I I always think about like to me, one of the most important social issues is the accessibility of education. And it's yes. amazing that you say like you know it, it was a nonprofit, so it had to be public. I love that because that seems to be like a problem that's everywhere. Is that people who can't afford it don't get access to the knowledge. Like if you can't afford to go to college and you aren't great at taking tests, you may not get the scholarship to go to college. Therefore you don't go. But like, I always thought in like the horrible reality is what if the guy who is going to cure cancer can't afford to go to school? You know what I mean? It's like when you limit education, everybody loses. It's so strange, such a strange way to be. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool that, uh, stuff like this is becoming more accessible yeah and, and that really is like my my mission <laughs> yeah, that's why i wanted to have you on i was like <laughs> this is someone i connect with <laughs> so, that's pretty cool though so uh as someone who has like seen it uh what do you think about the like crazy fast progression of technology in such a short time i mean we've only had the internet since you know the 90s and now we're here like how how nuts is that as someone who's like looking into the future just from a tech standpoint where do you think we're going yeah well you know i really think um to see the evolution of artificial intelligence is a big it's been a big oh yeah just to see that because it was just sort of like in the 80s and 90s it was like well you know we're not quite there yet and sure you know can they pass the Turing test yet? And yeah. you know, to now where it's so in, it's so embedded, and we're not even aware of how embedded it is. Oh yeah. Uh, that, um, and then to see see how it will, we'll have to work in teams with AI, you know, um, and how it will through the algorithms kind of determine and and, and embody biases too. Sure. So in talking with um, my partner on the Afrofuturist podcast, Ahmed Best, yeah. you know, we talked about artificial intelligence and how it needed more African soul within it. Yeah, it was a great, great episode. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, and so, you know, I, um, seeing, seeing how we progress with that and seeing how the, how the nature of work changes, too, for me is really key here. Um, we'll have to redefine work, I think. Um, sure. Um, and while it, you know it will create different jobs, um, I, I think our, our 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 daily our weekly work life will be reduced. You know, in you know you see it happening in in Sweden. You know, where they're reducing it like to thirty five hours a week or thirty hours a week or six hour work weekdays. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And um, I go back to a book often that I read growing up called um, Equality in the Year 2000 by Mac Reynolds. Mm-hmm. And it was an amazing uh, book. It was a it was a riff off of um, another book called um, – who was it by? It was by – it was called Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. And Edward Bellamy was talking about the year 2002, but from 1887. Sure. <laughs> it's like Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and Mac Reynolds talks about how a meritocracy emerges, where you know some people, just a few people, really work, but other people develop passion hobbies, right? And the kind of educational, lifelong learning work that they do, sure. you know, people kind of then just immerse themselves in in you know anthropology or archaeology, and you know, so they study the heck out of that, and they become experts in that. They don't really, you know, they're not really, they're contributing to human knowledge, but not necessarily doing it because they have to. Right. Um, and passion just, makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really do believe that. And so I think, um, I think that 
we we may like recreate a society where work is thought of as as more of a passion hobby rather than something you, you have to do to 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 provide for yourself sure uh, i mean because in that book equality in the year 2000 uh everyone gets a guaranteed annual income you right. know it's called basic income these days or universal income mm-hmm. and i think that's, that has to be part of our future in some way sure um, but but redefining work because work is still something that means doing meaning you know for the ideal of work anyway is to is to have a, a meaningful purpose in life right you know achieving something so um so you know have, putting those types of policies in place where people get paid to to stimulate them to create rather than because they they have to so so i'm looking i'm looking forward to becoming more like europe yeah. you know and, <laughs> i hear you I hear you <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy. AI is like one of those things where like half of my brain is like, this is going to be amazing because it's just in a lot of ways going to make things easier. Uh, you know, the like Mark Zuckerberg approach to it. It's like, you know, the, the benevolent like people that would just make life more convenient. But then there's a tiny part of my brain that's like Elon Musk. That's like, oh, they're, they can open doors now with their robot friends and do backflips. This is this could be used for evil, <laughs> but I think yeah, that's more us putting our sensibilities onto a machine. I mean, I, I I tend to be more optimistic, but at the same time, though, you know, um, fake news. Oh yeah, is really going to be to to become a part of our landscape. I mean, if you're talking about virtual reality and augmented reality, you oh, know, yeah. um, it, you'll you'll already be able to immerse people into environments that that they think will are real yeah. so how not convince you know how can you not not convince them that this really happened and this is what obama said but he didn't never really said that but we have good sophisticated technology that can put people you know new words into people's mouths oh yeah it's terrifying <laughs> Any, anything that can be used to do good can also be used to make evil I th- yeah, I think about yeah. that a lot as well. And when you are like toxic tribalism that is like permeating this culture now, it's like you can get yourself into an echo chamber and whoever's supplying the air can give you whatever truth they want now. It's so scary. But I think by and large, we're going to be okay. Um, that's yeah. that's yeah. A- AI is going to be pretty cool. I will say I do get kind of freaked out when like I'm having a conversation and then an hour later I see an ad on my phone for that thing I talked about. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's like I know you're listening, but can you be a little less obvious? <laughs> Why am I seeing an ad for sausages? I I don't I don't get it. <laughs> so that's been it. That's been that's been fun. And then, and Alexa, it's like one thing. This is amazing because I've seen this in every science fiction ever. You know, it's Jarvis. Uh, but on the other half, I'm like, I'm glad she can't get mad. Yeah. <laughs> While you're trying to read, she's turning the lights off. You're like, let, let me in the door. You unlock this door right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I I always told this joke that like, you know, with your phone one day becoming self-aware, it's like in the event of a Terminator situation, you'll be hiding in the corner and it walks by and your phone's going to be like, he's over here. You're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just, just things right. to be aware of. Just things to be aware of. <laughs> Get the coordinates. That's right, exactly. <laughs> Your phone will give you yeah. up in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so step one in the in the event of a Terminator apocalypse, break your phone. <laughs> it's not that important. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and you're an actor, right? I mean, uh, you, I, you do act. I do. Yes. It's a. It's fun. It's very very fun. Um, it's weird. <laughs> it's a very weird thing. I also have this weird feeling calling myself an actor. Because I feel like there is almost a stigmatism to it, you know, where it's like, I'm an actor. Oh, you know, everyone's an actor kind of thing. Like, I act in my own kind of things. But then you also have to kind of own it. It's such a weird, weird thing in the industry from what I've learned. And just the, the few years that I've been really hitting it, it's like uh-huh. it's like you have to care enough to do good work. But you also have to pretend like you don't care to get the work. It's a, it's not healthy is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> 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 yeah, but they, yeah, they, yeah. You know, you know another thing I think of that's crazy as far as technology goes in that vein is 
the rapid progression, especially in a commercial market. So, like, I remember in, let's see, it would have been 2007, I had to buy a USB flash drive for a class. And it was 8 gigs, and it cost me $85. Oh Whereas God. now, I have a flash drive on my keychain that's, like, 50 gigs, and I paid, like, $15 for it. <laughs> it's so nuts how quickly things are going. So it, um, oh, Yeah. I remember when I had one of those huge Macintoshes. Oh, yeah. The color. You could kill someone with that yeah. monitor. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I can't believe how big it was, like a 21 inch thing. And it was just, I mean, it was, it was not just that the, the screen was big, but the back of it, right? The whole yeah. thing space. It's like TVs. Yeah. You know, TVs used to have giant tubes and like massive backs. And now we're like, it's kind of see through. Like what is yeah. what is going on? We've reached the future with none of the social benefits yet. Let's figure this out, people. <laughs> right, right. Oh man, yeah. that is nuts. So, uh, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. Um, what do you think about like specifically in a commercial market, right? Where the way that we are, uh, I mean, in this country, definitely, where it's things have to sell, and so much so the technology is. It's like we're using the technology, but also to kind of sell things um, as a detriment to the people sometimes. Uh, but what do you think about the idea that people are running out of ideas? Because you hear that a lot. Uh, I don't necessarily believe it, but I'm curious as to where you stand on it. Well, you know, I mean, Shakespeare got his ideas from, you know, um, the stories that were widely circulating around time. Sure. That people could recognize those stories as many ways in many ways why his plays were so successful mm -hmm. you know so i i think that we are um always reinventing ways to tell stories differently sure. you know and um and that we are human so the same sorts of ideas and tropes recur so i you know i don't i don't know if we're running out of new ideas as much as as that we just find new ways to tell interesting stories and, and that people's experiences are, are vastly different. I mean, if in a world of 8 billion people, you, I don't think you can run out of a new idea. I mean, Noam Chomsky says in his linguistic work that the ability for us to uh, create a sentence is actually means that we can create a sentence that is infinitely long and that has an infinite number of ideas. Oh, okay. I like that. And um, and I think, you know, so from a social science point of view, our brains have the capacity to constantly create new ideas. In fact, we have to. We're kind of wired for it. Agreed. Because we're always adapting to new circumstances. Sure. Um, and um, also another author, scholar that I like a lot, um, Yuval Hariri, mm -hmm. he wrote... Um, he wrote a book about uh, storytelling and history, and um, I forgot the exact title of this book. But mm -hmm. you know, he talks about how we're great at telling stories that we then think are real. You know, uh, um, but okay. One of our, our success as a species is that we're able to tell stories that are imaginative, that are that invent new things. Sure. Uh -huh. Imagination alone is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, yeah, I don't think we're running out of new ideas. Um, I, you know, I think, I think, you know, you will, each, you know, there, there's so many untold experiences of people that we have yet to tap into. I mean, that's why I like the Black Panther so much as the movie, because it kind of breaks that space oh, more wide. Oh, for sure. <laughs> For sure. So that's yeah. yeah I, I I agree with you. I agree with you. It also blows my mind when I think about the fact that everyone in history were still people. You know, because like we think about uh, like Shakespeare. Shakespeare. When you think about it, he's just a dude, and like just living <laughs> his life kind of thing. Because we have this way where we're like history. You know, we can build these people up and like these heroes and this. Wow, they did these things and they changed the course of everything. But at the end of the day, they were still just people. And that, that blows my mind. Blows my mind. Yeah. 
yeah exactly right it's, it's, it's like one of the, it's like it's amazing but and also humbling in the sense that like you, it you it makes you not want to limit yourself you know what i mean when you get into that frame of mind you're like they were people i'm a person the <laughs> possibilities are are there given if there's one thing that i've learned doing this particular show talking to so many amazing people is that luck is preparation meets opportunity and time and time and time again i've seen that you know it's like if you're willing to to be there at the moment of opportunity like you have a chance just by being there and uh if you've done the work beforehand the threshold for success is far higher uh but i want to talk about how i came to know of you and that was oh. via the uh the afro futurist podcast which uh i call my show the interesting podcast but i think your show may be the most interesting podcast oh thank you <laughs> it's i absolutely love it cuz i i love learning new things and i love hearing about things that I have no context for, given my experiences. So how would you define Afrofuturism to begin with? Yeah, um, so Afrofuturism, as a term, was coined by a white cultural critic, Mark Derry, in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. He's interviewing Octavia Butler and um, Samuel Delaney and other science fiction writers. And what he saw was kind of a, a, a pattern definitely in the post-war era of the black imagination flowering. Sure. And, um, and it was a, a, a literary artistic uh, genre that sort of reframed um, the old colonial narrative to one where people were portrayed as having a future and a progressive future augmented in various ways by magic, technology, science fiction, grounded in African traditions and the black East diaspora too sure. and you know so it's about reframing that whole experience of the middle passage as well coming from the home planet of of africa to a new world using the latest technology to subjugate us sure. and and the african you know the africans in america had to become hybrid innovators dealing with how to adapt to a new culture like on the spot yeah, of course. And fashioning tools and appropriating Christianity to create sonic fictions, spirituals of right. redemption that gave them hope and dreams, you know, encapsulated their dreams for freedom and to just deal with the day to day living and slavery. That's so, right. so Afrofuturism really combines, um, you know, ref reflecting creating black identity through counter histories hacking appropriating network software cultural analytics remixing enhancement and augmentation gender fluidity post human possibility kind of releasing releasing black people from the colonial mentality and and just experiencing the multitudes and possibilities of the universe sure you know? and um and so like sun ra you know he's he 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 saw himself as coming from a different planet right you know and um and i think that it's like seeing lieutenant uhura in star trek you know she represented that black people had a space in the future and so for me afrofuturism is is really that 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 mix of of reframing our narrative um right and 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 saying that we have a place in the future um and so I got involved with Afrofuturism um, more more closely in 2014 mm -hmm. when I answered a call for a book, an anthology called um, Afrofuturism 2.0, uh, The Rise of Astro Blackness. Oh, sweet. And, uh, and it was from Ronaldo Anderson, who was a co-editor of that volume. He's at a St. Louis Haristow State in Missouri. And... He was trying to extend uh, – we together were trying to extend what Afrofuturism meant. So mm -hmm. that's what became Afrofuturism 2.0. And, uh, and then having you know, various artists and academics come together and, and, and think about it. You know, what does Afrofuturism mean? And from my perspective, I got to kind of rethink and do a counter history of my experience in the futures world and sure. future thing and discovering – you know, really those moments where 
felt like I was the only person of color in the room. Right, right. <laughs> so, and 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 trying to see myself in these futures that were being created. You know, some of them seemed very upper class and oh, you yes. know, very rich and luxurious and you know of a suburban experience I didn't necessarily have. I hear you. And, you know, so it was it was that and and then um last year um a friend that a colleague I had been working with on futures thinking, Aram Seinrich, texted me and he said, Oh, my brother in law is interested in Afrofuturism. And by the way, he played Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. <laughs> Just Whoa. so you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a little like, thing. He's in a little movie. I had known Aaron for like, you know, a few years. Yeah. By that point, a few years. I was like, oh, I never. When were you ever going to tell me this? <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you did what? <laughs> so, and it turns out, um, you know, so that turned out to be Ahmed Best, who, you know, we 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 FaceTime together, hit it off. We expressed how much, you know, we we had a vision of the future and how we often felt excluded. Uh, in discussing that future mm -hmm. and, and he said you know maybe we should start a podcast you know and let's call it the Afrofuturist podcast and who 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 would be better than to talk about Afrofuturism than Jar Jar Binks you know someone who's been part of the Star Wars franchise thought about the future thinks deeply about the future created the the CGI um, model exactly you know, CGI. yeah so it's I was like, damn, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. So it, it made Afrofuturism really real to me in terms of people. You know, that's the thing. You know, you'll meet people who don't necessarily have known that what they're doing is, is about the black imagination. Right. And, and it is. It absolutely is. And so kind of bringing people into the fold and saying, you know, let's, let's, let's really think deeply about this. Let's make Wakanda now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Dude, that's amazing. It it is such an interesting show. I'm really glad you guys are putting that out there. It's just it's it's just so new. It's so new. It's so different and I'm learning a lot and it's it's so it's so nice to hear intelligent conversation. Uh especially on subjects that I don't think are out there very much. You know, especially to like I I mean, I don't want to say regular people, but regular people. You know, <laughs> people that aren't necessarily in the rooms where this stuff is being discussed. Uh, so yeah, thank you for that. It's a it's a cool show. I really enjoy it. Um, but dude, we got to talk about Black Panther. Yeah, you brought it up a couple times. How amazing <laughs> was that movie? Oh man, I've seen it four times now. D good. <laughs> it's it's so good. I remember walking out of that because I'd been listening to the Afrofuturist since the beginning, and then when I watched this movie, I was like, "This is what they were talking about." <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> the whole yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's when I, I like I often tell Ronaldo, our co editor of Apple Futures on two point I'm like, You're 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 the futurist. You predicted all this. Yeah, yeah, for like exactly stuff that you guys have been talking about for months. I was like, yeah. what I ha I have context now. You know? <laughs> it was so good. And the fact that like Ryan Coogler's from Oakland. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Right. That's, right. that's pretty you, good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I think it, it tells the story. You know, it's funny because people in Oakland will say, well, you know, um, yeah, we, we want we want people. We don't want people to be murdered in our city. And at probably the same best. time, <laughs> you're right, probably. Best, but, we don't, you know, we don't necessarily want people to know every all the good stuff about Oakland either, because it's it's, you know, we're on the down low. Yeah. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> you got to maintain the, the, the face. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, we made Black Panther, but also don't mess with us. You know, it's right. still it's still real here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And 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 but Oakland is an epicenter of, of 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 innovative culture and food, and you know, um, interesting ways to think about diversity and expanding that envelope. And um, and so I think the Black Panther really you know put us on the map again in a, in a more positive way. I think so too. I think so too. I love that, like you, because you and you and Ahmed talk a lot about uh, the history of tech infused with art, and the fact that they're not mutually exclusive. And when I saw Black Panther and I see Shuri, and I was like, yeah. she is the Tony Stark of Wakanda. 
So she's <laughs> got like these repulsor blast things, but they're shaped like panthers. And she's got the like tribal makeup. I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I, dude, I loved it. Uh, I like at the beginning of our talk, I talked about like I I love culture. I really, really do. I just love I love yes. people. I have a genuine interest in humanity, which is what this show is. And in Black Panther, the fact that different tribes were wearing different colors, and like oh. each tribe was almost not divided by color, but represented by a certain color. I was like, this is how tribes were because they had access to a specific plant. And the plant that was blue, so this tribe that was closest to that plant would have blue clothing and like the homework that they did to make this movie, and it feel it feels important. The movie feels important. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. I just learned from a colleague of mine that Ryan Coogler and um, his team put together like a 500 page book about the history of Wakanda. What? <laughs> yeah, I'm like. I'm like, please release this book. Yes. <laughs> Dude, that's so cool. I loved it. And I'm so excited because you can feel the paradigm shift with something like this. And then at the time that we're recording this episode, the Oscars are tonight. And Do Get Out is like nominated for Oscars. Yes. It's crazy. Like in the yeah. best way possible. Because you know, Get Out's amazing. I'm assuming you've seen Get Out. You know, I've I have not seen it. I've seen clips. Dude, and it's I... so good. Jordan Peele, like I think Jordan Peele is going to be like one of the next big directors. He just he has an eye for it. It's so cool. I really want to see it. I mean, I loved uh, the whole premise because you know the way it talks about living in a in in, in horror. Um, yes. And making that front and forward, and um, you know, kind of like the invisible lightness of, of whiteness, you know, or the, the, the knapsack, you know, that we're, we're, we're white people aren't always aware of, 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 sure. of what we go through. So seeing that, but then, and then having it augmented by the Black Panther is like, okay, I think they're both great films to actually see together. Sure. You know? <laughs> sure. It's so, it's, it's so interesting. Like I said, I like hearing new things and like things I wouldn't have context for and talking to people about things that I know nothing about. Uh, and I think more people should be open to conversation about everything, especially the uncomfortable. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm glad the conversations are being had. And uh, Black Panther is just great, man. I could, I, could, I could go all day at Black Panther. It's such a good movie. Well, I love how it's a complex narrative. It doesn't let, it doesn't let Wakanda off the hook. Yeah. Right? Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so good. And, um, yeah, I mean, my favorite character is Shuri. And, um, Same. and then... Same. And, <laughs> and all the women are so badass. I love that. And, you know, Agreed. just confident. And, um, but, well, and the cost, the costumes, right? Oh like my you said, God. Amazing. I love how they, how they, how they use their capes as shields. Too. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. It it's was so, so good. Cool. I like, I want those capes. Same. I want, Same. I want, I want to ride a rhino. <laughs> Oh yeah! <laughs> when he when he showed up riding a rhino, I was like, "That's the most badass thing I've ever seen." <laughs> riding into battle, and I loved the the Jabari tribe. They're vegetarians. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the greatest jokes ever. <laughs> I love the humor in it. Oh, it's gold. You no, know? gold. Um, yeah, right. I mean, and 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 how and how you know they don't let the white guy talk. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. I mean. <laughs> it's great. It was self reflective in a way that we're just not used to seeing. So agreed. I, I loved it. Same. Um, I, I, I saw four D. What? Too. How was that? I've never seen a movie in four D. That was my first time. How was too, it? In Los Angeles. It was wild because it was like being in a simulator machine, and the seats move. What? And, yeah, they actually move. It's like a ride. Yeah, it's like a ride. Dude. So it shakes, especially during the fight scenes. And then you get little um, little punches in your back when people are hitting each other. What? Yeah, yeah. That is crazy. <laughs> and whiffs of air as like maybe bullets pass fly you and mists of water as water is being thrown at somebody. It's like... <laughs> that is nuts. I did not know any of that. I was like, okay, it's like 3D but better. It's like a ride. Yeah, it's like a ride. Dude, speaking of technology and going ahead, the movie experience is that. Good lord! Yeah, yeah, right. That, like, wow, that is amazing. <laughs> well, I just noticed we've been talking for over an hour already. Right. 
Dude, time flew. This was really, really cool. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank and, you. It's and, so fun. In my opinion, I think time is the most valuable thing you can give to someone, and uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, this was fun. This was really fun. It, it was. Thank you so much, Brian. It was, it was great talking to you. Absolutely. Uh, where can people find you online? Oh, um, well, I'm at um, – you can – you can. I'm at actually Avi at uh, – Let's see what's my what's my handle now. <laughs> I think it is Avi Lonnie Brooks on yes, Twitter. Avi Lonnie Brooks on Twitter. Um, that's a good way. And also, I'm Doctor Dot Brooks at Gmail dot com. Um, and I'm also uh, help run the Afrofuturist podcast Facebook page. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So we have that it's a Facebook page, and um, I'm also. Um, at the communication department at Cal State East Bay on our website there. So you can find me there as well. Sweet. There are multiple avenues. Definitely check out the Afrofuturist podcast. It's great and does a way better job articulating things than I do. <laughs> but thank you again. This was great. And...